Good morning. How's everybody? Good. Uh, my name is Archie. Um, I do a lot of things, but today I'm going to talk about creativity, uh, and I'm going to talk about adventure, and I'm going to talk about money. Um, those three things. So the title of my talk today is called No Money Big Whammies, and you'll find out uh, why in a second. Click. I, you can't really see this, but in the 80s there was a TV show, a talk show, or a game show on TV called Press Your Luck. Uh, and the idea of the game show was that there was this square of squares that would light up, and there would be three contestants, and you would have to press, and you had three things that you could land on. You could land on money, a prize, or you could land on a whammy. And if you landed on a whammy, everything that you had worked up to, prize and money-wise, would be lost. Um, so it really was pressing your luck. There seemed to be no order to this. Uh, it was random, and, and it was kind of an adventure game. Uh, you can click. So people got really excited uh, when they did this. You can see again. This lady's name was Joy. She was pretty happy. Uh, you can go again. Yes. Um, so. In 1984, there was a guy named Michael um, Lawson, and he was a simple kind of Ohio man. He wore simple gray suits. He drove an ice cream truck. He didn't make much money. Um, kind of a boring guy in a way, sort of un unsuspecting. But in Ohio, his goal in life was to find the next scam. He was kind of a scam artist, and he loved to get rich really quick. He loved to make money, um, and he was really good at it uh, to the point that, you know, if if a bank had some deal where you could open a checking account for $500, or you would get $500 as an incentive, he would open one, close it, and then he would get a new name and go back to the bank and open up another one, right? So in the 80s, he started watching these, these game shows and started figuring out, man, there's got to be a way for me to make a ton of money by watching these game shows and either betting on them or getting on them or finding some sort of pattern. And that's when he found Press Your Luck. So for months and months and months, he would tape Press Your Luck and he would stay up at night with his wife, and he would watch them, and he would wait. And he would, he would have the, like, v, the VCR controller, and he would wait and click it and try to land on a whammy with the contestants every time, right? To the point that he finally found a pattern in it. So he went on the show in 1984 um, and started making a lot of money very quickly to the point that he walked away in one night with $110,000, which had never happened. Uh, and Press Your Luck felt super cheated. Uh, but it was super exciting for him, and he thought, man, I got something here, you know? I can get rich quick, right? Um, I have no interest except for money, which is rad in, a, in one way and, and not in another. So he goes home, and within a month, um, the radio station, the local radio station, had some sort of contest that if you could match the serial number that they gave you with a serial number on a dollar bill, they would give you 30 grand. So he was like, well, this is great. I just won $110,000. I'll take it all out in $1 bills, and I'll lay it out in my house, and I'll count them until I find the number. Right? So he gets through about half of it, 55 grand, and he goes out with his wife, um, and he goes out for dinner, and he comes back, and all the money's gone. Somebody had robbed his house. Right? So this is sort of like the biggest whammy of all time. <laughs> um, you can go to the next one. So play that. Um, Around 1987, my, my mother took me to Sears to get my portrait taken. Um, she was really proud of me, and she loved dressing me up in outfits. Obviously, I still dress up in little outfits. Um, and she dressed me up in an Oshkosh Bagosh green overall set with stripes, parted my hair, not dissimilar to the way it is parted today, um, and I got my, my photo taken. That same year, um, you can go, another guy in another state with another mother a whole other life, had the same exact outfit with the same exact position, nearly, uh, and the same exact face. Um, I met this guy in architecture school at Virginia Tech um, my freshman year, um, and we quickly became fast friends, and it became pretty obvious that our lives were sort of running in parallel, um, and we had the same sort of interests, to the point that when we had met, we had both that previous week picked up this book in the library at the architecture school called Tell Me Why. And Tell Me Why was a book that came out with a young design firm in New York City called Carlson Wilker. And it was a German and Iceland designer that had met through the internet and decided, we're going to go on an adventure, we're going to go to New York, and we're going to start a firm that allows us to play, to do what we want all day. And we're like, man, that sounds awesome. And you know, school was fun, but 
you know, school is school. And, and we existed in this sort of fantasy land in art and design, and that's what we wanted to do. So we started meeting regularly. You can click. This is Tell Me Why, the book. Highly recommended. Um, we started meeting regularly, and we decided, man, like, our minds, this is basically this playland. So we called it Play Lab. And this was when we were 19. So we started meeting for coffee every morning, and we had these napkins printed up. And we would sit across from each other at a table, and we would try to make each other laugh. We would try to do something that would excite the other person or inspire the other person. And we would let our minds wander through drawing, through writing, until we would hit on something. It would be a seed of something. And we would say, man, that, that could be a project. That could be something right there that we could work on. Um, so here, this is, I don't know what that is. This is, uh, you know, a, some sort of lunar lander that was built from the Earth and, and shot, or Saturn, it looks like, and shot to the moon. You can go to the next one. We would draw all sorts of things. We would end up at weird places. This was toys as medical tools for children. This is healthcare reform uniforms. Um, next one. Back, yeah. And this is handled toast. You know, what if you could walk into a store and you could just pick up your toast, toast to go. So they would be really stupid ideas, really funny ideas. All in all, it was just fun. And it came from a place of imagination. You can click. Um, so immediately we decided, man, where is the best place in the world that we can do this for a living? Um, and we were young, but we were like, OK, well, as soon as we graduate, we're going to move to New York City. We're going to make it big. And we're just going to play all day. We're going to start a company. Um, so we basically had this sort of one year, two year, five year business plan. Uh, but we got to New York City and obviously it's expensive um, and nothing goes as planned. So we, we got jobs for a little cushion, right? Uh, I took a job at Cornell and Columbia Medical Centers and I became a senior designer pretty quickly for their interaction displays and, and screens and whatnot. And he worked for Rex Architects, which is a design firm that came out of OMA, Rem Koolhaas' firm. Um, and he did a lot of really good work there. But it didn't last for more than a year, uh, essentially because when you work for a firm, um, typical design firms, typical designers, there's, there's a process. And a client comes to you with their problem, and you solve it with your services. Right? And that's fun for a little while, especially when you're young. But because we had this <laughs> other life going on, these imaginations running, we wanted to be able to solve our own problems. Right? Um, and that's how a designer works. You, you propose questions and you answer them pretty quickly. Um, but we wanted to answer our own questions. So within a year, we, we decided to open up the office. Uh, you can go. We went to Bank of America. We opened up an account. We got, <laughs> we got incorporated in 2008. And click. Um, and then we got an office. Uh, we, just started, we just started working. And at first, with clients, but our ultimate goal to try to be self-sufficient on work that we initiated ourselves. Um, and you can go. So there's four projects that I'm going to share with you that we've done over the past two years um, with, with no client, um, with no promise of money. And it just came from a place that, of ideas, things that we wanted to do in the world, and wanted to see how far they could get. Because we're young, we have nothing to lose. The first was PyLab. Um, there's a group of designers, there is a group of designers called Project M, and they meet globally, yearly, um, with no goal other than to do something for the greater good with design. Um, something that would inspire somebody or change somebody's life. So we drove to Maine, uh, Belfast, Maine, and we met for two weeks, and we wanted to solve some sort of problem. And everybody's talking about all these world problems, but in the end, everything seemed pretty daunting. Um, the only thing that we really wanted to tackle was conversation. We thought that conversation was the seed of you know, solving a lot of problems. So we figured the best place to have conversation was over food, that this is where conversation happened the most. And what better food to have conversation over than pie, because it was a universal food. Um, so we essentially baked a ton of pie promoted this very small event on this liberal coast town in Maine, and gathered all these people and had a conversation for a whole day. Um, and it was really fun. It was really special because we had done something that wasn't a poster. It wasn't a product. It was just an event. It was just a time with people. Um, and lots of amazing things were discussed. So we were like, OK, well, how can we blow this up to a bigger scale? Um, and we had known some people that had gone down to this town in Alabama called Greensboro, Alabama. And it was, at the time, the second poorest town in the country, um, very segregated racially. Um, and we decided, well, 
that's unlike anything that we ever grew up with. Let's, let's book a plane ticket and go down and see what happens. So um, we, we, we went down to Greensboro, Alabama with sort of no idea what we were going to do um, in this town called, or this county called Hale County. Um, the town is roughly, most things are left sort of abandoned, um, which is just sort of the state of the town. And we looked for a lot of places to see if we could open up some sort of shop or, or pie shop or, or something like that until um, eventually we looked at warehouses and we looked at old dilapidated barns uh, and we stumbled upon this place um, that this nonprofit in the town had already owned. And we decided we would open up a pop-up pie shop and we would try to gather people in the community um, after spending some time there. So we opened up the doors and opened up this little shop. Didn't really tell anybody about it uh, unless we were having dinner with them or we would walk around the town and meet people. And then people just started coming in. It was the first time something had opened up in Greensboro, Alabama in 10 years. Um, you can click. And people would just gather. We built a table. We built kind of everything in the place, baked tons of pies every day. Um, and we would have conversations at this table that were pretty fantastic. You can click. Pie. Pie lab. We must have a pie. Stress cannot exist in the presence of a pie. Um, and this is the local pastor in town. And people walked in all the time. He just walked in with a guitar one day, uh, and he wanted to play us music. And this happened every day for months. Um, and it was absolutely fantastic to the point that this little place couldn't really contain all the people that wanted to gather together. And people weren't gathering in this town. There's no gathering place. There's gathering places for black people, and there's gathering places for white people. And there's nothing where they can meet together. Um, so we decided, OK, well, let's apply for some grants. Let's see if we can make this a little bigger. Um, you can go. Uh, this is this guy named Scott Hamilton. And he, his father was a local police chief. And he had a dream to go to college. And, and he didn't really know how. And he, but he was really good at drawing. And so we sat with him every day for a couple months and drew with him. And then he f we finally got him to apply to college. And he got in. And he's, he's there now. Um, so we got a grant. And we were able to purchase this building in downtown Main Street. Um, and this is sort of a fake store. And this is sort of a fake store. That's the the way that it, it works down there. There's, there's nothing really in the downtown. And now it's sort of, so, it's completely self-sufficient on the town. Um, Worms, uh, the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York and this nonprofit called Storefront for Art and Architecture, they, um, they put out a call to redesign uh, street tents, a new type of street typology tent for, for street festivals in New York. And so we proposed a modular system um, that allowed for multiple different types of configurations. Um, and it made all these shapes, and you can put them together in all sorts of different ways. Um, and this is the way that it would look on a street. And we were excited by this because um, it would show, you know, well, the, the, the museum was specifically excited because it would show new ideas for a new city. Um, we had no chance in hell at, at really winning, and we, this is sort of the rendering. Uh, but we eventually won. Um, these were the, the tents and rendering. And we built these things pretty quickly. We had to figure out how to make these, which was a super big challenge. I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm um, going. Can we go to the pool? Just keep going to hit the pool. I'll talk to you guys after this, but we went to Saudi Arabia and we opened up a graduate, <laughs> graduate level course. All right. Um, so we wanted to work with people that, that felt the way that we did, that all things were possible, that any idea could happen. Um, and so we ran into this guy, Dong Ping Wong, um, who was an architect. And he had started an architecture firm the same time we started our firm. Um, and he had an idea that basically, you know, especially in the hot summers, that he, living on Manhattan, you're surrounded by water, but you're never able to actually jump in it or use the water to swim in. Um, and you know, he was focusing on ecological work, environmental work. And so he proposed um, to us you know, working on a project together. Um, there had been incredible history of floating pools, or pools in general. This is McCarran Park Pool in Brooklyn. Um, and if you go to the next slide, there was floating pools as early as the, the mid-1800s. So we proposed a, a floating pool 
uh, for the city. And with no, with no client or no real goal other than seeing if there was a reception for this idea. Um, but we proposed not just a floating pool, but a pool that would actually filter the water of the river itself so that you could actually clean, swim and clean water for the first time in the river. Um, and so the walls of themselves would actually act as the filter of the pool. Bingo. Uh, we wanted to kind of achieve this feeling that you, could, that you would be swimming in the river, but in this body of water that was clean. But that would um, bring attention to the fact that you know, maybe the future of this river, it actually could be clean. Uh, the shape of the pool basically came from four pools kind of stuck together. You have lap lanes, you have lounge, you have a kiddie pool. Um, and they, together they make a plus. Um, and you can even open up, this is one Olympic size swimming lane. So you could open it up and it could be a free swim or you could close it down and have an actual swim meet. Um, and the, uh, part of the shape came from the idea of a typical New York City intersection um, and it just sort of translated into the water. And we wanted to kind of achieve this, this sort of iconic uh, feeling of architecture in the city and it, that it would work well in all sorts of different situations. So this obviously was a pretty, pretty radical idea, it's something that maybe, maybe not ever happen. And we didn't really know what to do, so we just spent a month and we proposed this idea to the world. We, we designed a campaign, we, we did renderings, and we, we, um, we launched a website eventually. Um, and just kind of put it out there. Within, within a couple days, we started getting calls from, from people all over the world asking us for more information. And then by the end of the first week, we got a call from uh, the world's sort of largest innovative engineering firm, Era. Um, they, they met us for lunch and they said, hey, you know, this is, this is something that hasn't been done before and, and we'd like to, to help you solve it. Um, so we spent the next six months um, with them proving whether or not the pool would be feasible to do. Uh, both mechanically, electrically, and, and filtration and permitting. Um, and then at the end of all that, they gave us a, a stack report that said this pool can happen, and we're going to figure out how. Um, so recently, the past two weeks, we launched a, a Kickstarter campaign to raise the initial funds to, to test the actual the methods of filtration, which is three, layer, three layers of geotextiles. Um, and within a couple of days, we reached our goal. Keep going. Um, and now we're sort of in this place where um, we never actually thought this could happen, but it's getting closer and closer to happening. Um, this is Jeff on some Chinese TV station. This is me with the ABC News crew eating popsicles on the river. Um, and then most recently, you know, people as, as big in New York as Jay-Z are starting to write about it and say that we need this sort of as, as a new thing for the city. Um, and so that's where we're at. Um, running out of time, but uh, yeah, basically, thanks. Um, we start with an idea and, and want to see how far we can get it. Um, that's it. <laughs>